I've wanted to be a doctor since I was seven years old. It's really all I ever wanted to do. I had this idea of helping, and I got the idea of curing, helping by curing, and it propelled me through school, through college, into medical school, where I was then confronted with a question: What kind of doctor should I be? I could have gone for the sexy kind of ophthalmologist, dermatologist, plastic surgeon, fixed a lot of problems that way, but I came across cancer care, and I immediately knew that I wanted to be an oncologist. I wanted to cure disease, and I wanted to cure a difficult disease. I wanted a challenge, and I really wanted to help people more than anything. Let me fast forward a little bit. I think that curing cancer, treating cancer, and helping people live with cancer is an invaluable asset. It's something that we need more of today. But I think I might have been misguided. I think there's something more important than curing cancer, and that's preventing cancer. How about preventing disease? Where did all of us go wrong in medical school? With the idea that we had to fix the problems, and not really get enough attention on how to prevent them in the first place. When I look back, I don't think I was really taught any serious prevention. I was taught, well, you should move your body, you should eat less, good advice. But there's no real course in prevention, and if you look at doctors today, we don't get paid for prevention. You can't go in and use a code for prevention, except for children. For adults, a preventative checkup is a is a diminishing item. So now, how do we prevent cancer, and why is it so important? Let me give you a story about some of my patients. I take care of a lot of women with breast cancer, and you might know it, but breast cancer is really curable. Of course, the word cancer strikes fear in your heart right away, but 98.6 percent of women who get diagnosed with stage one or stage two breast cancer are going to be cured. Yeah. Now, a couple of things about that: it will be inconvenient, it will be uncomfortable, the surgery, the chemo, the radiation, and you know what else? It's going to be expensive, but you'll be cured. That's a good thing, right? But here's the worst part. Here's the rub. My patients who are cured are never totally comfortable in their body anymore. They don't trust themselves. They're insecure with respect to their own bodies. They don't know if low back pain is from too much exercise or is it cancer coming back. They don't know if a cough is just a cough. Is it my cancer coming back? That insecurity is a huge driver for me and my own patients to do more in prevention. I was at the annual oncology meetings, a huge assembly of cancer specialists in Chicago.、It、happens every year. About five years ago, I was there, and I had these ideas of prevention in my head. And I recall I was walking to a prevention conference. And if you've ever been there, it's these huge conference halls connected by linkways. And I was going across the linkway to a World Health meeting on global cancer prevention and non-communicable diseases, and literally every single other person was going the opposite way. I have never felt like I was swimming upstream so viscerally. And I'm also confident that everyone who was going the other direction. Was going to the exhibition hall, or going to a meeting to hear about an important and statistically significant advance in metastatic disease. I really don't make light of this. Adding a few more months at significant cost is still important because of the trickle-down effect. But it's a huge amount of money. Where I was headed was to learn about tobacco and obesity and diabetes and sedentary lifestyles. And how those lifestyle factors affect our risk of not just cancer, but heart attack, stroke, and Alzheimer's. And at the other end, where they were going, 
Their rooms were filled with post-its and coffee mugs with company names and dinners and huge multi-million dollar exhibitions. And that really struck me that we need to move some of the money from treatment into prevention. A tenth, a one percent would make a huge impact on cancer prevention. So at that meeting, it became very clear that these things I've described, tobacco, obesity, diabetes, poor food choice, sedentary lifestyle, alcohol, and infections, all of these things actually make cancer about 70 percent preventable. You might not have known that. 70 percent of cancer, in fact, most non-communicable diseases are preventable. So what about DNA? What about genetics? What about it's a lightning strike? Well, DNA is important in cancer, but it's not as important as you might think. It's, it's really important to know your DNA, but the odds of having a, DNA, a gene that's mutated that causes your cancer is pretty low in the population. I view DNA, DNA is not your destiny. DNA is your potential. DNA is playing a hand of poker. You could be dealt really terrible cards, but if you know what to do, you can bluff your way to a win. On the other hand, you could be given lousy cards, but if you study up, you can, you can make sure you know how to win best or whether you should fold and play the next round. So DNA is just one of these data points that helps define who you are. There are other data points. As you've heard, we're surrounded by data points. We're surrounded by wearable technology and sensors. We're surrounded by likes and tweets and social media. We have all of this information that goes to making us a unique biological entity. And I'll tell you another area, another domain of information. How about the laboratory test, right? It's not a test. Getting your blood tested is a statement. Do you get a test from Visa and MasterCard every month? No, you get a statement. Your retirement account is a statement. It's not a test. So I believe that by looking at our laboratory information and tracking it, along with all of the other data points in our lives, whether we live in a smart city or out in the country, looking at this data begins to identify who we are as unique individuals. We're not just humans. We're not just men and women. We're not just young and old. We are unique biological entities. So what I need to do is engage you in prevention, because this is a story of you or of us. It's not me. How can you prevent disease for yourself and your family? How can you visualize this? Well, I have a way that I think about it. So I need you to use your mind's eye and follow me. I see a 3D tic-tac-toe. Do you see it? The 27 glass cubes all lined up. I see my health in the center cube, in the center of this, almost like a Rubik's cube you could see through. That's your health right in the center, X, Y, Z, triple zero, say at age 25. But I also know from census data that seven out of 10 adults are dying from heart attack, stroke, and cancer. So I know that the walls of these cubes are illnesses. The cube I live in, the cube I hope you live in, is wellness. And we need to proactively get into wellness and avoid illness, and we have to visualize it because everyone, no matter what we eat or what we do, has been migrating from the center to that point where the wall of cancer and the wall of cardiac problems and diabetes and obesity all meet. It's so easy to predict. That's the issue. You can see this coming. So why don't we now measure it? Can we now see the transition points between wellness and illness and course correct? Can I look at my laboratory, my DNA, my gut bacteria, my tweets, my likes, my frequent flyer miles, right? The hours slept, the triathlons done, the truffle fries eaten. Can I look at those things and define myself 
and know when I've crossed a boundary, just like when you cross a lane on the freeway and feel those bumps in the road. I believe we have those transition points today, and that by looking at this information and looking at it dispassionately, it's not healthy, it's not good, it's not bad, it's not a red or a black laboratory value. It's just a statement. It's a statement of your biology, a reflection of what you've been doing and your physiology. But it will help you understand where you're going. It will help you course correct and maintain yourself in that wellness. So today, I ask you to engage in your own health and engage in what I call the pivot. That it's we're in a pivot. We're moving from a reactive. Illness-based medical system to a proactive wellness-based health system. That's what I want you to think about, and that's the journey that I want all of my patients and all of my friends to to embark on. Thank you.